Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Calvary Chapel, our midweek service. Uh, good to have everyone joining with us tonight. I pray that you already have your Bibles open and available, and as we'll be getting into the Word in just a few moments. So the Lord bless you. God is so good. Good to have each and every one of you again tonight. I just want to, uh, f first of all, read exactly what they put down here in the notes uh, for me are the announcements. And, uh, and I, I made a little note here, and I said, Calvary Chapel, you never, never cease to amaze me. And I just, uh, it says right here, during the time of our global camp pandemic, uh, there's been a huge shift uh, onto the online giving here at Calvary. It says, I am sure you're aware that while online giving is convenient, it isn't free. Now, this is my part. I was just informed today, uh, it says, I was informed this week, uh, today actually, that many of you are choosing to cover the cost of the convenience fee which you give where you give your tithe and your offering and so i just want to say you guys are incredible thank you for doing that uh the fees to to do the online thing are huge and uh I just want to thank you for your faithfulness. So the Lord bless you to do for that. Now, the other thing I want to talk to you about is very, very important. We are now starting the next stage, uh, the beginning stages of our reopening. So uh, we will be completely reopening uh, with the exception of the cafe, as we're going to be needing it for an overflow room. But we're going to be completely reopening, write this down, beginning Sunday, July 12th. Now, this means that the kids' church, the nursery, the youth ministries, uh, and all the other ministries will be reopening for the families that Sunday, uh, and we will begin to have our regular Wednesday evening services uh, beginning uh, July the 15th. So you can write that down, where we'll be meeting here in the chapel again. Uh, and all the other ministries, uh, be feel, feel free, it says, to begin gathering in person once again. Again, the cafe will not be open open because we need it for the uh, overflow area. Now, uh, with all that being said, this is going to be a slow process, and I don't want you to think that uh, as we're still following the CDC guidelines, uh, that, you know, as we do reopen, things will be a little bit different. So all the leaders, the kids' church director, the nursing director, all of those, uh, uh, the, the youth, the epic and hiding place, they're all putting together the new plan uh, as we're beginning our reopening next month. So again, uh, beginning Sunday, July 12th, we open completely, uh, and I'm very thankful for that. Also, it says here, now we will continue the health and safety of our congregation during the second stage. Uh, we must continue to practice social distancing. We have to do that. I'm sorry. I know that it's, it's not my rule. It's the rule of the CDC and, of course, Governor Abbott and so forth. So we're going to still follow the, the standard protocol. We're going to take your temperature at the door and so forth. However, with all this being said, beginning not this Sunday, but the next Sunday, which is June 24th or 21st, the mask will then become optional. It is entirely up to you whether you want to wear a mask or not to wear a mask, not beginning this Sunday, but the following Sunday. So that is absolutely your choice. However, we still want to do everything we can to maintain the safety for everyone who enters the door of this church. So uh, you be wise in what you do. And again, if you don't feel safe returning, I want you to stay home and I want you to listen online and so forth. So with all that being said, one more time, well, one more thing. If a spike occurs in the coronavirus that is highly, highly dangerous, and there, every, every spike is dangerous, then we, this, is, this could become a tentative plan. I hope that doesn't happen, but right now we are planning again to reopen uh, everything beginning Sunday, July the 12th. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we praise you in Jesus' name for all that you're doing here at Calvary. Lord, we are working faithfully through this pandemic, and at the same time, Father, wanting to keep the safety of all the people. And we pray, Lord, as we look to you to lead us and guide us, and also impart wisdom to us during this time. 
And Father, tonight I just, I, I, I just lift up Pete Rainier to you, Lord. And Lord, you know all that's going on. You know his condition. You know everything that's happening with the doctors and the, the liver transplant stuff, all of that. But Father, I pray for a supernatural assurance and peace to just fall upon Allison and upon Pete and his family tonight and that you would touch their lives. And Lord, all those that are perhaps bedridden uh, here at Calvary, Lord, we pray over them right now and all the people that are even listening that might be ill, that you would touch them. And Father, we pray over this sick, divided, confused world that we live in. We pray for the peace that passes all understanding to engulf our nation, Lord. And tonight, Father, I just pray in this simple Bible study that, Lord, you just touch us all. Touch us with your word. May we all hear your voice. In the mighty name of Jesus, and everyone says, amen. Turn in your Bibles tonight to the book of Psalms. We're going to be in Psalm 28 tonight. We're going to just cover that very quickly, and then we're going to move into our main psalm, which will be Psalm 29. As I talk to you tonight, the voice of the Lord is. Let me say that again. The voice of the Lord is, and we'll define that in a moment. But let's look at the Psalm of David in uh, Psalm 28 tonight. David writes, and he says, to you I will cry, O Lord, my rock. He says, don't, don't be silent to me, lest if you are silent to me, I'll become like those who go down to the pit, or another, meaning uh, go down into death. So Psalm 28 is another wonderful psalm of David's. And, and he said, oh God, you are, you are my rock. And you know what? Jesus is certainly our rock tonight. And he has ears to hear when we reach out to him, when we go to the throne of grace. He says, oh, hear the voice of my supplication when I cry or when I pray to you when I lift up my hands toward your holy sanctuary, lifting up holy hands without wrath or doubting, the Bible says, that posture of prayer. Now drop down to verse 6. He says, blessed be the Lord, <clears throat> pardon me, because he has heard, and here's that word, a very important word, voice tonight. He has heard the voice of my supplication. And so David is rejoicing because God has answered his prayer. Verse 7, the Lord is my strength, my shield, my heart trusted in him, and I'm helped. Therefore my heart greatly rejoices, and with my song I'll praise him. The Lord is their strength, and he is the saving refuge of his anointed. Save your people, bless your inheritance, shepherd them also, and bear them up forever. And may we all say amen to that wonderful prayer, that wonderful psalm of David's. Now, tonight, let's move from this, uh, uh, the voice of David crying out in supplication in prayer from David's voice to Psalm 29 to the voice of the Lord. And this incredible, wonderful, unbelievable psalm. Uh, its entirety is about the worship and glory of God. So as David begins this, I want to uh, speak out just a few things I want you to notice. The first thing is, is this is about a storm that David's witnesses, okay? We're not told the occasion of the writing. We're not even told how it goes about or happens. But it is a masterpiece of poetry. Matter of fact, H.A. Uh, 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 oh, Ironside said it's the finest poem in the entire Bible. And so it's been called the Psalms, a psalm of seven thunders, only 11 verses, and seven times the voice of the Lord is mentioned, and 18 times the Lord is mentioned. So tonight, the voice of the Lord is, and let's let God's word define that, beginning in verse 1. David starts out and he says, give or ascribe is what that word really means. Give the glory to the, to the Lord. So, so give unto the Lord, O oh, you mighty ones, give unto the Lord the glory and strength. So this psalm, he starts out, David, I don't know where the pen in hand is. I don't know where he's at. He starts out and he says, oh, you mighty ones. That's who it's addressed to, meaning I believe that it's talking about the heavenly host in heavens, in the, in the heavenlies. And God says, David says, all the angels, man, just you need to give praise and glory and strength unto God. And he says, and give 
unto the Lord the glory due his name. Worship or bow down literally. Worship the Lord in the beauty or the majesty of his holiness. So three times David says give or ascribe and every one of there it ends in the worship of God. Now listen carefully. I don't know, we're not told where David was when he penned this. I mean, David might have been, maybe he was in a cave, or maybe he was out in the field, and uh, I don't know. But he saw in the distance a magnificent, beautiful storm that was approaching out of the Mediterranean, coming into there to Jerusalem and so forth. And so uh, when he sees that storm, he ascribes or gives glory unto God. I'm going to ask you a question. We are in a storm in our nation and around the world, this pandemic or whatever. When you see a storm come into your life, do you ascribe glory to God? Do you see God in the midst of the storm? Do you see his glory? Do you hear his voice in the midst of the storm? I'll tell you, we need to give God praise because there's not a place that he isn't. And that's what David is doing. He's giving glory to God's name and like we do the same. The Bible says in Philippians uh, 2, 10, 9 and 10 and 11, it says that, that, the name of the, uh, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, those in heaven, those in the, on the earth, those under the earth, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. The Father. Now look at verse 3. Here comes the, the voice of the Lord now in this storm. Watch. Now the voice of the Lord is over the waters, and the God of glory thunders, and the Lord is over many waters, and the voice of the Lord is, there it is. What is the voice of the Lord? Well, number one, it's powerful. Number two, the voice of the Lord is full of majesty. So it says that God's voice it thunders. It shakes like thunder. You know, when I was a little boy growing up on the farm with my grandparents, whenever a storm, of course, back then you didn't have air conditioning in the house, and you had the bathroom was outside in the outhouse, and all the windows were always up. But whenever a storm, a blue norther, man, when it blew into Texas, you saw it all way out in the distance. You saw the lightning before you ever heard it. And then you started hearing the thunder. And if you remember, you probably don't, but we would count the, and, you know, after the thunder and so forth. And we would time it how far away it was. But every time we heard that thunder, my grandmother would always say to me, Billy, she said, God's talking. That's God speaking. And you know, that's exactly what David is saying right here. He says, oh, the voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. You know, how powerful is God's voice? Well, he said, let there be light and light was. He created the world out of nothing. He spoke, the Bible says, and it was done. He commanded, the Bible says, and it stood still. The voice of the Lord is powerful. How powerful is God's Word? The living Word of God that's right there in front of me that I'm reading from right now. The Bible says in Hebrews 4.12, it says, For the Word of God, it says, is powerful. The Word of God is powerful. It has energy. Why? Because it's God-breathed. And it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of the soul of the spirit and of the joints and the marrow, the deepest part of our nature. And is it a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart? It analyzes the heart. It checks out our hearts. That's what the Word of God does because it's powerful. Listen, I don't have to make God's Word powerful when I teach. God's Word already is powerful. It's alive. It's living. Look at verse 5 now. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. Yes, the Lord splinters the cedars of Lebanon. So the, evidently David, wherever he is, the Mediterranean, the way out in the Mediterranean, the storm is coming in, and now it's entering into to the cedars of Lebanon or this, that area. 
And it says that the voice of the Lord splinters the massive, incredible, huge, gigantic cedars of Lebanon. He turns them, I guess, into toothpicks. You know how a storm can do, and, and, and so forth. He makes them also leap or dance or skip, it says, like a calf. In Lebanon and Syrian, that would be Mount Lebanon and Mount Hermon, by the way. It says, they, like a young wild ox. Now watch this. And the voice of the Lord divides the flames of fire, meaning the lightning that's striking and so forth. And the voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. So now the storm is moving from the Mediterranean into Lebanon, now to the extreme southern area uh, of, of Kadesh there in Judah. So from the far north, it, it comes in and just makes all this destruction. And now from the south, it travels through Kadesh. And the voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth. In other words, a premature birth, if you will, because they're afraid of the storm. It strips the forest bare. In other words, the leaves, the branches, I'm assuming, and, and uh, the bark. And here it comes. And in his temple... His temple in heaven. Everyone says glory. The angels giving glory unto the Lord. You know, many scholars believe that whenever a storm blew into Jerusalem, that the priest in the temple, they would sing this psalm. And also the children would sing it in their homes whenever uh, the storms blew in and so forth. But here's the deal, loved one. Listen, it says everyone in his temple says glory and now we are the temple of the, of the Spirit of God, aren't we? The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 3.16, Do you not know that you are the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells in you? Maybe we should all say right now, glory to God. The Lord sat enthroned at the flood, Noah's flood, remember? Now, that's the voice of God's judgment. All the earth, every living thing perished except those who went into the ark, Noah and his family. Now watch this. The Lord sat at the flood, and the Lord sits as king forever. So the Lord is over all of his creation, and now evidently David is saying, you know what, now the storm has passed through. It's done all that it's going to do, and God still sits enthroned because God is in control. You know, storms blow into our life. The earth can be shaken. Things can happen. People get all shook up and so forth. But God can never be shaken. It says he sits as king forever. Now listen carefully. You and I, we will have storms in our life. And this pandemic thing or whatever's happening in our nation, all the rest of it, Loved one, listen, it feels like one long storm that has no end in sight. And I know that it can wear us out, but can I say something from this psalm? Loved one, listen, expect God to speak to you in the current storm, in every storm. Why don't you start listening if you're not? Why don't you listen to his or for his voice? Be expectant. David looked at the storm and he saw God's glory. Why don't you do the same? David, he looked in the storm, and you know what he saw? He saw God's power. David looked in the storm. He heard the voice of the living God. That's what we need to do. Never forget, just like David just said right here, never forget, no matter if it's the deluge uh, and the days of Noah, no matter if, if it's the storms of the cor coronavirus that, that is coming into and just engulfing this world, listen, God, he is in control, and in the midst of the storm, look what God gives his people. Look at verse 11. And the Lord will give strength to his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. The entire world that we live in is so confused. It is so out of balance and kilter right now. Listen, this storm that we're going through, it's a storm filled with confusion, a storm that is fueled by this pandemic and the protest and all the things that are occurring. But in the midst of it, if you're God's people, it says, look at it, the Lord gives strength. God shares his power with his people. 
Philippians 4.13 says, For I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. It says he gives something else. He, he gives what the world can never give, and that is peace in the midst of the storm. The Bible tells us in Ephesians 2.14, he himself, meaning Jesus, he is our peace. Jesus says, in the world you shall have tribulation. But he said, but I have given unto you my peace. You can have the very peace of Christ himself. Listen, we don't need to fall apart, but we do need to keep our eye on the Lord. And I know that if we see the things that are occurring over and over, you watch it enough. It's going to discourage you. It's going to depress you. Because it seems that everything is out of control. The economy's out of control. The, even the decisions about the coronavirus, up and down, up and down. The things that are just happening, is, is, it's so surreal right now. But what does God promise in his word? It says in Philippians 4, 6, it says, be anxious for nothing. Don't be torn apart. Don't let, the, we get the word angina, you know, don't have a heart attack. Don't, 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 don't be divided. So be anxious for absolutely nothing but with everything by prayer, supplication, with thanksgiving. Let your requests be known unto God and the God of all peace. God's peace, his very peace will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. The two areas that Satan attacks. The two areas that the world attacks. The two areas that the flesh attacks. Loved one, listen. In the midst of our storm, God can give us strength. He wants to give you strength. And he wants to give you, he wants you to rest in his peace. But you have to be on the right foundation. What did Jesus tell us in Matthew 7, 24? He says, if anyone hears these sayings of mine, and doeth them. I'll liken him to a wise man who built his house upon the rock, and the winds and the storms and all of it came and beat against that house, but that house didn't fall, for it was founded upon the rock. But he who hears these sayings of mine and doeth them or does them not, I'll liken him unto a foolish man who built his house upon the sand, and the storms of life came, and the waves and the winds and all the rest of it, and great was the fall of that house. We need the our hearts filled with the Word of God. But the voice of the Lord is something else. The voice of the Lord is yet future. The Bible tells us in 1 Thessalonians 4.16, listen carefully. <clears throat> Paul says this, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, now listen, with the voice like or of an archangel, in other words, like the angel. And with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will ref, uh, 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 rise first. In other words, that's a shout that raises the dead, praise the Lord. And then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them and the clouds and meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. And Paul, the apostle says, listen, therefore scare one another to death with these scriptures. No, he doesn't say that. He says, comfort one another with these words. The catching away of the church, the rapture as we call it. Loved one, listen. The dead in Christ are going to ride first, and then we, man, they get their brand new bodies, and then we who are already here and we're alive, all of a sudden we're going to be caught up together with them into the clouds. We're going to be there with the Lord. We're going to be with him forever and ever and ever and ever. Now listen, it's going to happen instantly, suddenly, a twinkling of an eye. Not one prophecy needs to be fulfilled for this to happen. It could happen right tonight, right now. The Lord could take the bride of Christ, the church. He could take us home right tonight. We could be caught up in the air. We'd hear the voice of the Lord. Now, that voice is yet future, but it is coming, and it is certain. I know that there are people that, Bill, we don't believe in the catching away or the rapture of the church. Listen, I love you. If you don't believe that, that's okay. I'll explain everything to you on the way up. How does that sound? But the fact of the matter is, let me give you something to think about, okay? If you don't believe in the catching away of the church before the great tribulation period, that seven years that's coming upon this planet that happens after the rapture. In the rapture, Christ comes in the air. 
second coming, Christ comes to the earth. Remember, his feet touch down upon Mount uh, Olive. And it, he brings all of his saints from heaven, which is the church, with him. In the rapture, Jesus comes for his saints. And I just said it. In the second coming, Jesus comes with his saints. In the rapture, it takes place in a minute, a moment, a twinkling of an eye. The second coming takes place at the end of the seven years of tribulation. In the rapture, it has only to do with the church, but the second coming of Christ has to do with the nation of Israel as God comes and he, and he saves the nation, that remnant, and they look upon him uh, whom they have pierced, the Bible says. Now, in the rapture, only Christians will see Jesus, but in the second coming, everyone, every person on earth will see him. It says this in Revelation 1, 7, behold, Jesus is coming. He's coming with clouds and every eye will see him. Even they who pierced him, meaning Israel, remember? And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. I'm talking about the voice of the Lord. It is filled with power. It is filled with majesty. You remember after Jesus' high priestly prayer, <clears throat> pardon me, in uh, John 17, after he had said all these things, it says in John uh, 18, 1, Jesus, who is now with his disciples, he's going to cross over and go to the Kidron Brook. He wants to go into, uh, the, uh, into the garden, and he's going to pray there. And it says in, in John 18, 1, and when Jesus had spoken these words, John 17, his high priestly prayer, he went out with his disciples over the brook Kidron, where there was a garden, <clears throat> in which he and his disciples entered. And Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place. For Jesus often met there with his disciples. And then Judas, having received a detachment of troops, officers from the chief priest, Pharisees, and listen to what Judas came with, all those people. Oh, they came with lanterns, because see, it's night, remember, it's Passover. And it says, and, 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 uh, with lanterns and torches and weapons, now, Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, listen carefully now, he stepped or he moved forward and said to them, whom are you seeking? And they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said to him, I am he. I am that I am that I am. I am the eternal God. I am the beginning and the ending. I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am He. And Judas, who betrayed Him, stood with them. Loved one, listen. And then when, they, when Jesus said to him, to them, all those people, I am He, guess what they did? They drew back and they fell to the ground. Why? When Jesus said, I am, I am the eternal one, the name for God. Listen, our Lord's, our Lord, Lord's voice, it manifested with a fullness of, of uh, glory and so forth. And you know, uh, the soldiers, there was at least uh, a detachment, is 600 at least Roman soldiers and all the scribes, the Pharisees, over 600 at the word, the voice of Almighty God, the God-man. They were, man, just blown down, blown to the ground. And that wasn't an act of worship. That was fear. They lay on the, on the ground, Judas and all of them, helpless. Their lanterns were helpless. Their weapons were helpless. He, they're standing in front of God, the God-man. He said, I am he. They heard the majesty of the voice of Jesus, the voice of God. Again, let me just read from the psalm that we're covering, Psalm 90, 29, 4. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. He has all authority in heaven and upon the earth. 
He's our great high priest. He's, a, he's the sustainer. He holds all things together. Whenever Jesus told the disciples to get into the boat and, uh, and we're going to the other side, it says that Jesus uh, got a pillow and he fell asleep and the boat starts filling up with water and they're crying out, oh, Jesus, master, master, wake up, we're perishing. And then Jesus arose and he rebuked the wind, the storm. The, he rebuked the raging of the water. The word rebuke means, Jesus said literally, be muzzled. Be muzzled. Hush. Be quiet. They heard the voice of God. And listen what happened. And the wind, it ceased. And there was calm. Luke 8, 24. Jesus, the voice of God. Jesus stands weeping by a grave of a dear friend. And then Jesus speaks and he sends his voice into the unseen realm. Okay? It says in John eleven forty three, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And guess what? The dead came forth. Loose him and let him go, the Lord said. Listen to me, the voice of the Lord, Psalm 29, 4, I love it. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. And we are living in a storm right now, and God is in our storm. He's in it right this minute. May I say to you, listen to me, it's time, if you're focusing on the storm, it's time to stop, loved one. You need to hear the voice of God in the storm. I pray in Jesus' name, may God, the voice of our Lord, thunder again in our hearts, and may we all fall to our knees. He is here. He is here in the midst of the storm. Jesus said in John 10, 27, my sheep, he says, they hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. Listen to me. God doesn't practice social uh, uh, distancing. He doesn't do that. He is here with me. He is there with you. He is with us always, even until the end of the age. No. Has the pandemic has it, has it caused you, has it caused the church, all the, the corporate church, to lose its prophetic voice, the voice of God? I mean, I, I look at what's going on right now, and, and you know, when the head of the church, if we stop looking at the head of the church and, and we no longer uh, focus the right way, we don't have a voice anymore. No. Jesus said in Revelation 3.20, he says, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone, here it comes, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in to him and dine with him and he with me will have that fellowship, will have that intimacy, the new birth, whatever you want to call it. He says, I, I stand at the door. Now listen to me, if Jesus is standing at the door of our hearts, man, I'm going to tell you what, that means that Jesus is very, very near. And his knockings upon our heart, the door of our heart, that is the voice of the Lord. And he is knocking, loved one. He is knocking right now. Do you remember that great story the song, in the Song of Solomon? You know, one of the w incredible studies, you know, the Song of Solomon. Jewish men were not even allowed to read the Sol Song of Solomon until they were over 30 years of age. And women were never allowed to read it. What a great book it is. You remember the Shulamite woman who is the wife now of Solomon. And he writes in there, and let me just give you one of the quote here in the Song of Solomon 5, 2. And his, you have to, let me set this up. His wife is asleep in the bedroom. And uh, Solomon has been out. He's going to come back late at night. Let me read now. He says in Solomon 5, 2, Song of Solomon 2, 5, 2, I sleep, but my heart is awake. Now, that's Solomon's heart. He's restless. His heart is awake. He's not ready to sleep. Let's put it that way. 
And then, it, listen to me, it is the voice of my beloved. And he knocks, saying, open for me, my sister, my love, my dove, my perfect one. He's asking his wife, the Shulamite, open the door for me, honey. Let me in. He says, he says, and Solomon says, my head is covered with dew. Maybe it's been raining. I don't know. My, my locks are, are like with the drops of the night. So it's, it's late, and he's seeking intimacy with his bride. He's, she says, I've taken off my robe. How can I put it on again? I've washed my feet. How can I defile them? You know, in other words, well, you know what I mean. My beloved did something. Listen to what she says. My beloved put his hand by the latch or the opening of the door. No doubt when Solomon reached for the door to go into the bedroom where his wife was, the door was locked. So it says, my beloved put his hand by the latch or the opening of the door. And she says, and you know what? My heart yearned for him. She started thinking about Solomon. And I arose. This is what she did. Now listen, loved one, I'm going someplace. I rose to open my beloved, open the door. And my hands, when she opened the door, they dripped with myrrh and my fingers with liquid myrrh on the handles of the lock. She woke up or not woke up, she got up. She ran to the door and opened it up, but he wasn't there. And what did Solomon do? He left the myrrh, the beautiful perfume, all over the handle of the door. Why? Because he was hurt? No. Because he was angry? No. Because he was in love with his wife, and he wanted intimacy. And so there, the sign of, it, that his, he, he, of his love, the, the, the myrrh, the perfume. And so remember, see, he was knocking. Open the door for me, my love. Open the door up. Christian, when the knocking stops, remember the knockings are the voice of the Lord. When the knocking stops, that means the Lord's left. Don't, whatever you do, and I'm saying this to me just as well as it is to you because it has been so surreal since March 13th, the things that this church and other churches around the world have been going through. Loved one, listen, don't allow the pandemic. Don't allow being away from church, us gathering together. Don't allow that to do this to you. Don't be like the Shulamite. Oh, listen, you know, don't fall asleep. I, I'm asleep, but don't bother me. Leave me alone, Lord, you know. I'm comfortable. Oh, no, don't, don't fall asleep. Don't, don't you dare lose intimacy with Jesus. Don't you become comfortable being out of church. Don't you become complacent being out of church, meaning meeting. Listen, I'm going to say something to you, and I say it in love. You can email me, cuss me, do whatever you want. But if you are, if you are comfortable enough to go out to a restaurant and eat dinner or eat lunch or have breakfast, then you're comfortable enough to leave your home on Sunday and get back in fellowship with the body of Christ. We're safer here than you are at uh, wherever you eat. Believe me. That sounded pretty good, didn't it? I like that. Amen. Somebody said amen up in the media booth. Hallelujah. Okay. No, don't become content. In other words, we no longer, I don't want to get up and rise and open the door for the Lord. Well, the myrrh is all over the handle. You know, he loves us. Oh, no, listen. Don't become comfortable and complacent or you will not rise. You will rise like the Shulamite woman and it will be too late to open the door and the only thing you're going to find when God is knocking open to me, open to me he wants his voice to penetrate your heart and you know you're going to be just like the Shulamite woman, you're going to open that door, he was there and all you're going to smell have is the smell of the, of the beautiful myrrh that's all you're going to have because he is gone Listen to me, church, 
Jesus is knocking. We must hear his voice again. We cannot sleep. We cannot slumber. We need to be praying. We need to be seeking God. This pandemic is not bigger than God. Loved one, listen to me. If we don't get up and open up the door, then you know what we're going to have? We're just going to have his fragrance. It means he's left. It means Jesus loves us. Of course, he'll never leave us or forsake us. But we just will have the fragrance of his presence. Maybe that's what's wrong right now, that the church is living off the fragrance of Jesus and not the presence of Jesus. I tell you that we need to hear his voice. Do you want fragrance or do you want presence? Do you want to hear his voice in the storm? Then you'd be expectant. God is in control. They can work all they want to with this pandemic and all the other hell that's going around the world. I'm telling you, God is in control. He's in control right now. He will always be in control. He is king forever. Psalm 29, 4. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. I love you dearly. I miss you. I hope to see you Sunday. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. In the mighty name of Jesus, let us pray. Father, thank you for this night. Thank you for this short Bible study. Thank you for your word that you've exalted above your very name. And Lord, we we want more than your fragrance. We want your presence. We want to rise when you knock. We want to run to the door and open unto you, Lord. We want to sup with you and dine with you and have intimacy with you. We're asking that you baptize us afresh in the Holy Spirit of God. Wake us up. Wake your church up. Because in the midst of the storm, you promised that you would give us strength, share your power. And you would impart your peace to us. Lord, we receive it right now. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. And we all say amen and amen. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. Love you dearly. I'll see you Sunday.